Yes. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Happy New Year. I hope you all have a great uh, holiday. Uh, and uh, thanks for coming back to our GR seminar. The first talk of this seminar uh, <laughs> is given by Dr. Prashan. And uh, Dr. Prashan got his uh, PhD in physics from the Institute of Fundamental Research. And now he's a fellow of a uh, fellow of BHI in Harvard. Uh, uh, today is uh, the top the top of his the title of his talk is passing three time uh, geometry with image of su uh, supermassive compact object. <coughs> Pardon uh, <laughs> the future. Okay, so looking forward to his uh, silent talk. Ready? Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me here. Um, yeah, uh, I wanted to share some of these recent results that we put out in the last year or so. And um, so we, the HD image, uh, the supermassive compact object in the center of our galaxy, Thalcaeus uh, which is pictured here. And uh, this is a this is expected to be a black hole. And what we want to do, what 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 I want to talk about today is. What we can do with this image, uh, with respect to tests of the space-time geometry outside uh, astrophysical objects, and um, there's also th this, this entire literature. There's a, there's a lot happening, and uh, a lot of new results coming out. And uh, there, there's also uh, yeah, there's also uh, some work that's being done. Uh, right now, looking to the future, where we want to be able to, with higher resolution uh, imaging uh, techniques, we'll be able to decompose this image of a black hole into, uh, we'll be able to resolve finer features in the image. And we'll try to see what these, uh, you know, higher order images uh, give us about the, what they tell us about the space time geometry. Um, so let me just jump in. The reason we want to uh, do any of these things is that we we would like to understand. We, there are a few things that we can test, particularly in strong field gravity. For example, uh, we can we can ask what nature of the compact object is, whether it's a regular black hole, like whether it's described by uh, a regular black hole solution, or whether it's a black hole solution uh, of a vacuum solution of uh, GR or some other theory, etc. Whether it has some sort some sort of hypothetical surface. Uh, all of these objects would have different space-time geometries and hopefully they would, this signature of these different space-time geometries would show up in the images. So um, that, that's one, one part of the story. Other, other thing that we can do is actually ask whether we can uh, test uh, principles like the Nohe theorem, which says that, you know, at asymptotically late times, astrophysical black holes will uh, get rid of their multiple moments and eventually settle down to the curve solution. So we can ask whether this is actually true, whether this holds uh, in, in nature uh, using observations. We can also uh, sort of look for violations of the energy energy conditions, which are typically associated with, uh, I mean, uh, known regular black hole solution models. Uh, we can also ask whether there are violations of the equivalence principle. And these are the sorts of things that we can start testing with uh, access to strong field gravity. Also, of course, is, uh, uh, we can test the existence of additional fields in the description of physics, uh, which various other fields also uh, invoke, for example, in cosmology or um, etc. And we can ask whether these have any influence in the in the image of a black hole and whether they sort of uh, they build up close to uh, in the vicinity of a supermassive black hole. These are things that we can try to test. Of course, finally, we want to also look at alternative theories of gravity and to understand whether the low energy effective limit uh, receives corrections. Um, because of this, because of a deeper, say, quantum theory of gravity, uh, which are visible uh, in the change in the space time closest to massive black holes. So these are all the sort of, sort of things that we want to go towards. And uh, so, uh, but there's also another, uh, there's, there's another way to see the same thing thematically. So uh, on the one hand, this, and this is also how uh, the literature has sort of progressed. There are two, there are two sides. One is, of course, uh, you take a particular theory of gravity, find stationary solutions in those, and ask how those uh, those stationary solutions, what the images of those uh, stationary solutions look like, and compare them with observations. That's that's this branch of the story. On the other hand, you could say that, let me 
we only have available to us a certain number of theories. Let us agnostically uh, deform uh, the metric and try to ask what is the constraint on these uh, deformation parameters. This will also sort of give us something towards the uh, test of the new theory. There are two broad uh, themes. And uh, so we have these two images of, uh, and now the EHT images of two astrophysical objects, Sagittarius A star and MAD Sagittarius star. They, these have these characteristic uh, central intensity depression. So what you're showing, what I'm showing here is the brightness uh, on the sky. And you see that there's this dark region here. And this is very uncharacteristic of say, for example, stars or other sorts of things where you would expect that when you look towards the center of the star, the intensity will sort of be constant or uh, increase, and, but definitely not going down. So this sort of suggestive of something uh, called a photon sphere, which, which we'll get to in, in a couple of uh, minutes. And you see that both these objects, the two that we've imaged, that we're able to image, uh, are both uh, showing this characteristic central brightness depression. Uh, so I'd like to, uh, so we'll go from here, from this image, to understanding what is the purely space-time independent feature, uh, which is called the shadow diameter, uh, over the course of the next few minutes, and then we'll come back to come back to the slide. Uh, come back to the test of gravity and the slide. So the outline for the remaining uh, part of the remaining talk is the is initially I'll just tell you uh, what the relevant uh, observable for black hole imaging uh, techniques is, which is the size of the shadow uh, on the image plane. And also uh, then we will we'll talk about, like I said, uh, how you how you're able to get constraints on the shadow size and therefore test uh, space times. And we'll I'll just describe the results that we get and look to the future. So um, so just uh, very briefly, uh, let me start by just uh, recapping this. So if you take a spherical symmetric space time, you can also cite it in, in this form uh, in general. And the Lagrange for Jesus motion is given like this. You, you Because of killing symmetries, you have two constants of the motion. But there's also a third called the Carter constant, which uh, is indicated, which which is related to a hidden killing uh, symmetry. And you can separate out because, because of the existence of four constants of the motion, including of course the Lagrangian. Uh, you can separate out the, the geodesic equation uh, essentially, and this is you can write down the tangent to any arbitrary null geodesic in the space time like this. So uh, what you can see immediately for null geodesics in particular is that the energy of the energy of the orbit just sort of scales out, and we we introduce these sorts of these sorts of parameters called the uh, energy scale angular momentum psi and the energy scale Carter constant eta, and uh, this eta in spherical symmetric space time is just going to be the square of the angular momentum. Um, so now what we want to do is look for locations where spherical null geodesics are estimated. So you have geodesics that are r dot and r double dot equal to zero. So they are constant r surface. And you, you solve for these solutions. Uh, you, I mean, you solve for this and you get essentially a, uh, the full uh, range of locations in r and eta where you are getting uh, very, very have uh, spherical energy that are possible. But in spherical symmetry, actually all, all orbits are planar. So you can just show this by looking at uh, this equation, which is an Euler equation. So you can just see that they're all planar. So these orbits are actually circular and in the space time. And so this is, this corresponds to a region of extremely strong gravitational density. So you can imagine that if you're standing at that spot, you and shine a, shine a torch from the back of your head, you're actually going to see it. Uh, because the light is going to lens all the way back to you, and this is the, this is the most lens you can get. So uh, the reason uh, this this surface is called the photon sphere, where you have uh, photons moving on circular orbits, uh, spatially circular orbits in this uh, sphere, and um, so uh, that's the first part. It is an important location, and uh, also in general, I, I want to say where do photons appear on the sky. So given the given the tangent that we have previously, you could you could construct the following. Imagine you're an observer at uh, asymptotic infinity, a static observer at asymptotic infinity. Uh, so this is your uh, space space. Uh, this is your tetrad that you're carrying with you, or, or triad actually. And uh, you can you can look at your past light cone, and uh, you get you get a bunch of uh, photons. Uh, these photons all have tangent vectors that are given by the equation that I showed in the previous slide. Uh, so you you know exactly what the content of your uh, how to label each direction in your past light cone, and you just do a, a stereographic projection onto your onto a plane like shown here, and that gives you what we call the image plane. And so you can 
use tangents to spherical uh, tangents to arbitrary geodesics, project them uh, in this way onto this image plane, and you can find where a photon with a particular uh, set of conserved quantities, eta and xi, impact parameters, where it will appear on the sky. So if you label these, this image plane with Cartesian coordinates alpha and beta, then you can just show that uh, your, um, uh, I mean, the photons with, uh, with the conserved quantities eta and xi appear at this particular location. Now, uh, I just mentioned that all orbits are fully planar. So we can look at, uh, so, and also they're essentially copies of each other. So we can look at one, uh, let, let's look at one class of orbits, which is the ones with xi equal to zero. So from this slide, uh, you can see that this is basically a photon that doesn't move in phi. So it's phi dot is zero. These are, these are on meridional planes. Uh, and so uh, from this equation, what you, what you see is that it arrives on the sky at some zero comma. So eta is, is also called the apparent impact uh, parameter. So it just tells you how far from uh, from the principal uh, from the principal null congruence at the location of the observer uh, the photon will appear. Actually. Okay. So with that, uh, now let me just define what the shadow boundary is. So we have uh, so this this in the left plot here. I'm showing you uh, a set of photon orbits uh, in the Schwarzschild space time. And we're looking at one plane, but uh, as I said, all planes are uh, exactly equivalent. So you see that uh, photons that are appearing at large distances, large impact parameters on the observer's sky. Let's let's imagine the observer to be at z equal to infinity like this. So large impact parameter means uh, you know, uh, further away from the z axis. So you see that large impact parameter photons don't deviate by much. They don't undergo large gravitational density. But when you start going towards smaller and smaller impact parameters, you see that the photons are lengths to larger angles. Similarly, when you start from the from the center close to eta equal to zero, uh, what you what, what you see is that you don't have much lensing. But when you approach this particular uh, location, you start seeing that there's larger and larger lensing angles. So and, and this location is basically called the so this location is the point where when you shoot a photon in the uh, backwards into the space time. It will become tangent on the photon sphere. Um, it will it, end up on the photon sphere. So, so essentially, the impact parameter of a photon that will asymptote to the uh, photon sphere in the in the uh, when you shoot it into the space time, this is called the shadow boundary. So, uh, so this eta ps is what what we we'll refer to as the shadow boundary. And you can see from all uh, from all we've talked about just now, uh, this just depends on the causal structure of the space time. Uh, and nothing else. This does not depend on the astrophysics at all. Uh, so this is a purely space-time dependent feature. And this is the thing that we're going to run after, try to get, and then test uh, test gravity. Uh, so also, what, what I want to say is that, just to motivate why there is why it's called a shadow, you see that this, this uh, point here, uh, this line here, which is the boundary of the shadow, uh, it demarcates photon orbits into two, two kinds. There's the, the ones on the outside are photon orbits that start from that, that can potentially start from uh, asymptotic infinity and reach asymptotic infinity again. But the guys that are inside the um, inside the shadow shadow boundary, uh, this line here, these can these only these will, uh, these will terminate in the black hole uh, if you in the singularity if you send it, shoot it towards the black hole, or they will just you know be, you can emit them from outside the horizon and they will reach asymptotic. So they have far smaller path lengths. Uh, these two, uh, these two sets of photons, and what this also means is that the photons on the on the on the outside of the shadow boundary, they can actually intersect. Uh, they'll have larger path lengths through if there is some emitting material in the space time. They'll have larger path lengths through that, and therefore they'll pick up larger intensities. And so what you would see on the image plane is a sharp drop off in the intensity at this location. So now we see that from the first image that. I mean, uh, the first image that we saw, you had this central intensity depression. So that's basically coming from the fact that you have a photon shell in the space time and therefore a shadow. But we still have to work out how exact, what exactly is the shadow radius from that particular image. Uh, I also want to show you uh, this phase space picture. Uh, so you can you can look at photon. Uh, so I'm just drawing R uh, versus the impact parameters I. So you see that photons that start with impact parameters smaller than uh, smaller than the critical impact parameter, or equivalently the shadow radius here, they will when emitted outwards they'll actually reach infinity, and uh, that's true anywhere in this region. Photons that are emitted towards the black hole 
will just fall into the black hole. Then there's a third, there's a second region, which is this piece here. What in this region, if you shoot a photon in the outward direction, it just go to infinity. But if you shoot a photon towards the black hole, it will go in, meet a turning point, and then go back out. So there's a location. So th these photons have two legs to their orbit. Orbit. They have a r dot negative uh, leg, which when they will go in, and they have they have a point where r dot becomes zero. This is the radial turning point, and they go back out. So uh, this, this is quite nice uh, to see. Um, and we we'll come back to this this sort of picture uh, later towards the end of the talk. So all this was for spherically symmetric space times and spatial. In anti-symmetric space times, uh, there are various things that uh, that, uh, that happen. Firstly, uh, photon orbits are no longer planar uh, because you, you can't separate out the equation and write them as planar orbits. Additionally, uh, what I'm showing in this picture is the is the equatorial plane of a curved black hole for rotating black hole in the So you see here again some features which are similar. Photons with large impact parameters will undergo lesser lensing, smaller uh, will undergo less deflection. And photons with smaller, smaller impact parameters will also go, will undergo very less lensing. But in this range where you have, where the critical impact parameter is sort of line, we'll see that you have photons that are lensing through large magnitudes. So these features are sort of still similar. However, the space time is rotating. So you can see that photons that are uh, initially with, with angular momentum uh, sorry, uh, initially with angular momentum opposite that of the black black hole, they will actually get spun to. I mean, they will have to change their orbits and move with the black hole, as, as you can see, for example, from these sorts of things. This is called gravity magnetism or uh, flame dragging, and this is a very interesting effect that comes in uh, when you are looking at uh, spinning objects. And yeah, this is something that you could also sort of test. The spin of the space time becomes extremely important. Uh, so, just just to recap, what we've seen. Uh, you have a, you have a black hole here pictured in this black region. You have a you have a region just outside it. Uh, so, so the black hole, uh, the the black region corresponds to the surface of the event horizon, or the outermost scaling horizon. And uh, this this extremely bright region is the photon shell. That's where you have photons that are executing multiple loops around the black hole, and therefore you will have you, you will see this as a bright thing. Uh, and we're just looking now in, at the so, so let's say that there's an observer here at infinity at, at the, the boundary. So you'll see th this just sort of shows you how you will get lesser intensity uh, inside the shadow boundary. And this this set of photons that form this boundary will actually asymptote when you trace them backwards in time uh, to this photon shell here. Excellent. So yeah, you, you can say that the photon shell. Uh, so the there are two ways of saying this. Uh, the more geometric way, which I like, is to say that uh, the intersection of the photon shell world cube uh, with the past light cone at the observer is basically the critical point. So, um, uh, the, yeah. okay. So now we know we have the observable in hand. Uh, we know what we want to get towards. Uh, let's just do what. Let's let's look at what are the different sorts of things we can start testing. So uh, these, these are some metrics that we we've, uh, we've worked with. So first on the top is solutions, uh, electrovacuum solutions in general relativity. You have the Kerr Newman solution on the top, which is a charged and spinning uh, black hole in general relativity. And then we have the Kerr solution, which is just a spinning black hole, uh, no charge. Then we have the reason from black hole, which is no spin, just charge. Uh, and then the Schwarzschild black hole. And this RN star, all these stars indicate naked similarity solutions. So, the top, so we do the same thing with other classes of solution, uh, other theories, for example. Here we look at one low energy effective, the low energy effective limit of uh, string theory called the uh, called einstein maxwell Newton axiom theory. And uh, this uh, Kerr sense solution represents the electromagnetically charged uh, uh, solution, uh, electromagnetic char charge, under, charge under electromagnetism. And also it has a dilaton field and an axiom. This is uh, this is the percent solution, and the EMD one solution is this uh, solution discovered by uh, Gibbons, Maida, Gaffinger, Horowitz, and Schrominger in the eighties and early nineties, uh, which is just a non-spinning uh, charge black hole in, in this low energy effective limit of string theory. Here we have a series of regular solutions. Uh, these these are models that are uh, constructed to try to get rid of the curvature similarity at the center. These typically satisfy field equations. Uh, of some non-linear non-linear electrodynamics theory. 
Uh, and you, this is another naked singularity, the Janus Neiman Minicor naked singularity, which, which is a solution of the Einstein time uh, I mean, uh, Einstein scale of reaction, minimally coupled massless scale. Of and uh, yeah, this, this EMD2 is a different. Uh, in, is a different low energy effective limit of string theory, which has two copies of the human field. So these are different kinds of things that we start off with and try to try to see whether we can set any constraints on any of these guys. Okay. So uh, just before I go ahead, um, so I'm plotting here this the spherically symmetric uh, solutions that are either black holes or naked singularities, and you can see uh, from this uh, diag from this figure where I have GTT on the y-axis, that they cross zero uh, and give you horizons for the cases where you have a black hole. And for the naked singularity, uh, you just have a smooth fall off to zero. So the redshift equal to, I mean, the, the infinite redshift surface is just a curvature singularity itself. Um, additionally, you can, you can also see that how GRR looks like for these cases. And these are quite, quite different. The regular solutions and the uh, naked singularity and the black holes are quite uh, different. So uh, if you modify the space-time metric, you obviously modify the location of the photon sphere because uh, the photon sphere, as you will remember, is dependent only on the space-time geometry. And so here on the left top plot, I show you where the horizon, how the horizon radius changes for different solutions uh, plotted in different curves with the physical parameter in that solution. For example, if you take this, uh, this purple curve, which I have labeled as EMD, this is that black hole I was telling you about in this, uh, uh, low energy effective limit of string theory, Einstein Maxwell limit on. Uh, this is a charged solution. And the, the x axis denotes the specific charge of the black hole. Uh, and this, this specific charge uh, is the speci specific charge electromagnetically and also of the electron. So you can see that with increasing a specific charge, the black hole gets smaller. And this is sort of uh, true, in, true in general, uh, except for these cases which I will ignore for now. Okay, so, uh, so typically the horizon gets smaller. So you'd imagine that the photon sphere will also get smaller, which is what we see here. So the photon sphere is also getting smaller, and therefore uh, you would imagine that the lens location, lens size of the photon sphere, which is the shadow boundary, is also going to get smaller. So there's now the question is: is there an is there an, is this effect big enough that we can actually uh, you know differentiate different solutions? So uh, let me just go through this uh, again. Uh, uh, for the, so just comparing what we can do with different theories. So I write down the Lagrangian for the, uh, for Einstein, uh, Einstein Albert Maxwell on, on, in purple, and this low energy effective limit of string theory, which has the usual Einstein Hilbert term in the, in Einstein frame. Uh, it has a Maxwell full strength uh, uh, dilaton, which is here, and also uh, the axiom. So uh, the charge spinning solutions were discovered in these, uh, in these papers already. And the parameter space looks like this. So on the x-axis is the spin of the black hole, uh, uh, black hole, and on the y-axis is the specific charge of the black hole. So you see already that the the string theory black holes can be more charged than the than the GR black holes, and uh, the parameter space is also different. So what this shows, what I'm showing here in the bottom plot is the is three curves in black, is the side is is the curve of the shadow boundary of the Schwarzschild black hole. On the image plane, then on this is what this is the lens location of the photon sphere, photon shell. Uh, the the purple one is the is the curved black hole of uh, curved Newman black hole of some spin and charge, and the red one is the is a string theory black hole with some spin and charge. Here I show you what happens if you fix the charge and vary the spin. You will see that actually, uh, I mean the the sort of the shape of the critical curve. Uh, sort of deforms from a from a perfect circle when it, when the black holes are not spinning to this uh, you know sort of deformed circle uh, when you're looking at uh, spinning black holes because of free gradient. I can also see that the sh the size of the the size of the curve itself actually doesn't really change with spin that much. It really depends on the charge. You can see that in these two figures, I have changed the charge and I've gone to close to very large charges in the right plot. You see that the size from size differs quite drastically from the Schwarzschild black hole, as we expected. So, and this is just summarizing all the work. So, the size of the size of the black hole changes. Uh, size of the shadow changes with the with the spin, but the but the actual change is really with the with the change in the charge. Okay. 
So that that was with what we can do with known solutions, uh, different types of solutions, different theories, etc. What we want to do now is to look at uh, uh, metric parameterization schemes and ask agnostically how uh, deformed can your solution be and still be compatible with the EHT images of M87 or Cybertrix case one. So you can do this in various ways. You can choose a parameterization which is quite common in, in the GR literature, which is this post and uh, formalism. Or you can use some strong field metrics, but what they actually do is that they modify uh, the geometry close to the horizon while leaving, uh, while, yeah, they, they are, these alpha parameters, they actually tune uh, perturbations close to the horizon. But you could also do other sorts of uh, uh, parameterization schemes that are strong field parameterization schemes, and this is one such. So um, let, let me just say a few words on, uh, the, I worked a bit on this scheme, so I'll just say a bit on why we choose something like this. It turns out that this, this particular combination here, this Padi expansion in the conformal radial variable here, uh, is extremely effective at capturing various solution metrics uh, quite rapidly, the accuracy in approximating them is per traffic, which is, which is not very surprising. So let me just say, say something on what the properties of these parameters are before we jump into understanding um, into using these. So here I'm looking at models that are one parameter models of the uh, regular Redenko metric, uh, which, I, which either have epsilon uh, non-zero, a non non-zero, a one non-zero, et cetera. Here, these are two, two, diamond, two parameter models. Here, we compute what is the range such that these are black holes and unique black hole solutions because they are parameterized metrics. Here, we show what is the asymptotic structure of these, of these uh, parameterized metrics. This is the first post newtonian parameter, second and third. And you see that by, by using different parameters, different parameter combinations, you turn on different sorts of deviations in the, uh, in the, in the asymptotic structure of these space times. So it's quite, quite nice to sort of, uh, it's a good handle uh, to sort of test both the strong field and the weak field. Okay, so uh, I have these one-dimensional plots uh, where I'm looking at black holes which are deviate, which are deviating only in the epsilon um, parameter, a naught and a one parameter. A, the a naught parameter gives you control on the one pn uh, uh, coefficient, which has to be fixed by Birkhoff's theorem and also is observationally tested. And uh, a one is the two pn parameter. And epsilon is the parameter that controls the size of the horizon. So what I'm plotting uh, in these, in all these three plots is in black, I show the location of the event horizon of this black hole uh, with change in the relevant parameter, the photon sphere in blue and the shadow size in red. And remember the shadow size is what we want to, what we can observationally uh, try to get to and constrain. So here I just show you a sample constraint on the, on the let's say that your observations give you a constraint of the kind shown in this white band. You can then infer constraints on, on the epsilon parameter by looking at the red parameter. Excellent. And uh, so what also I wanted to say was that, so when you're, when epsilon is held fixed, the event horizon is, uh, is also fixed. It does not change at all uh, in, these, in, this, in this parameter. Experiment. So this is the two dimensional version of this. And you can see that you have families of black holes that have exactly the same shadow size. So even if you were to make, if you were to make a perfect measurement uh, of the shadow size, uh, which we can, which we cannot, you would still have an infinite degeneracy uh, where you have black holes that are deviating along this line would not be differentiated from each other. So uh, there is this problem that the, this inherent degeneracies would, are in, inevitable, and we will, in the second, uh, when when we look to the future, try to see what sorts of other observables we can use to break this degeneracy. Uh, so the way that we, uh, sorry, let me just say, so now I, I'll just quickly go through how we want to obtain bounds in the shadow size from observations. So this requires us to do realistic modeling of what is happening close to the black hole, take care of all the physics of the accretion flow and all of those things, get the images of these uh, you know, accreting black holes, and then compare them against the observations, and then hope to extract the shadow size of, of for example, salutary state from this process. So to model uh, the accretion flow, we use what are called generalistic magneto hydrodynamic simulations to model the accretion flow. And it looks somewhat like this. Uh, I will sort of go a bit quickly on this. So we do a simulation that uh, tracks the accretion flow and it gives you all the properties of, you know, the, uh, of the fluid over time, 
which is the plasma density, the velocity, the strength of the magnetic field, etc. In terms of which we can compute at each point in space and time how much emission uh, this fluid is is putting out. So at each uh, location in space, uh, how much how many photons have been released, essentially, because that's what we need when we want to compute images. So with that information, we we then uh, do what we call uh, generate this gradated transfer, which is basically this equation here. And this J is the emissivity that I was just telling you about. This is this, this is essentially energy conservation, or uh, I mean, this follows from Lewis theorem and phase space. Uh, but this gives you this I mu is the is the thing that you that your observer will actually catch, which is the intensity on the image plane. So you see this movie that's been running here. Uh, you trace the photons through the fluid and then compute how much how much intensity you will get on each pixel on the sky. And this looks sort of like the image that we uh, that we started off with at the beginning. So we do this for all the different kinds of black holes. So we change, we change, so these are all the curved black holes. We change the spin of the black hole, we change the kind of accretion that's happening onto the black hole, change all of these things, and then we get simulations and therefore images. And when we compare with data, as you can see on the left top here, you get constraints on these models. So you're actually able to rule out various different types of models based on data. So this, this is very promising. Perhaps this will also work uh, when we try to do uh, things when we're testing sorry when we're trying to test alternative uh, black hole or black hole models or alternate theories okay so like i said these are all curved black holes are generated okay? and now what we want to do is to uh, go to um, testing alternative space times before that what we want to do is to I, i'll just briefly mention what we mean by calibration method methodology so in all these in all these uh, pictures what we will get is a bright ring uh, like we saw also on the first uh, slide which has some diameter which you can extract and a width but we don't already immediately know whether this is the diameter of the shadow or not uh, because that because we have finite uh, we have various other effects various physical effects as well so what we want to do is to go from the diameter of this emission ring this bright ring that we saw in the image to the size of the shadow which is the the, sh the critical curve which is the purely space time dependent uh, feature which is not dependent on astrophysics at all. So the, to do this, uh, we take we quantify qualify under this uncertainties in this way. We say that we start off by uh, saying that the the diameter of the emission ring is probably not not exactly the diameter of the I mean the diameter the diameter of the emission ring that we get that we we write down may not be truly representative of the size of the emission ring when you look at the image plane because you're using some sorts of algorithms. And there may be some uh, discrepancies between the reconstructed diameter from data and the ground truth image diameter, which is actually on the image. So that you call the alpha two parameter, which uh, which is this term here. And now you have uh, you've gone from uh, the reconstructed diameter to what you think is the true diameter. With the true diameter, you can then say uh, this depends on both the space and geometry and also the emission physics. So you. Take, take into account various different efficient models and try to ask what is the relation between the true diameter and the shadow, uh, shadow diameter. So that's the alpha one calibration. It relates the ground truth image diameter and the shadow diameter this is the alpha one. And this requires forward model. So here you will take a, you'll fix the black hole space time, change your accretion, uh, accretion models. And for each accretion model or accretion state, you will get one alpha one, alpha one number for that same space time. So this is what we mean by alpha one calibration. And then uh, you, from this shadow diameter, we can uh, we can the shadow diameter actually scales with the mass. So you uh, you take into account the mass measurement from previous observations, like uh, using stars and so on. And eventually you end up with some with a term like this, uh, as I showed here, which is this delta parameter, which tells you how different your black hole, the, the shadow diameter of your black hole, can be from the Schwarzschild diameter. So this delta is really what we what we are running up the shadow diameter difference. Okay, so we we go through this whole process. Uh, this is this is the this is the hardest part, I think. Uh, so we go through this whole process. We get posteriors on alpha one, alpha two, alpha two, alpha one. The uh, the mass and also the measurement itself, which is the ring diameter. And from this, we obtain a posterior on the fractional deviation from the Schwarzschild black hole, given a particular emission. Ring measurement. Excellent. So now I'll just go through our results. 
So this delta that this delta parameter that we just discussed for Schwarzschild uh, for for Sagittarius A star, you can find for different uh, imaging algorithms on the along the rows and for different accretion models along the uh, columns and for different um, priors on the mass measurement. You can see that you get a delta parameter for all of these values and they're all roughly consistent with each other. So this tells us, this gives us confidence that, you know, we can actually extract the deviation parameter of a black, of a black hole that is consistent with Sagittarius A star from the Schwarzschild uh, black hole. Excellent. So the angular shadow size looks like this. There's the guy that we've always wanted to get at. And I just plot all of this uh, in here. So this is, the image, this is the image that we actually had. And from this, after this whole calibration process, we see that the shadow diameter is actually somewhere here. So uh, it's not naively as one would think just this dark region here, because there's blurring effects due to finite angular resolution. This is the actual shadow diameter that uh, Sagittarius A star has, and the errors that we show. So now we have everything in place. Uh, we have the observable, we have the measurement. And so uh, this, this is how, uh, so also, also before I go ahead, already at this point, this represents a null test of general relativity. So here we plot the delta parameter the, that we got from this whole process. And in the blue shaded region, what we show is the fractional deviation parameter for curved black holes in general relativity. So if, for example, your peak were one sigma or two sigma away from this uh, blue shaded region, you would say that that's a violation of uh, general relativity. Because we expect astrophysical black holes to be uh, to be more uh, to be uh, curved black holes. So, so this is already excellent. Uh, and okay, I'll just skip over this. Um, yeah. Could you explain why they look so similar when we're looking at the M87 down the barrel and we're looking at the star? The why is there the Ah, I see. Right. So, okay. Maybe I'll just go to this. So, what you were, what you're thinking of, is a picture that would occur if the accretion flow is actually a thin accretion flow. So, in that case, you would see this you know, sharp uh, thing. This is a very diffuse. Uh, I mean, there's there's emission coming from like a geometrically thick region. So, what I mean is that the scale height is not zero. So, this sort of, you know, the images that we construct is a you would not have this thick uh, thing in there. Because okay, so right. So if you imagine spherical accretion, uh, you will you will have radial rainfall. Let's say uh, you can work out analytically and show that uh, the shad because the path lengths are different for the photons that are that are crossing the photon shell and those that are not. So the photons that are not crossing the photon shell have basically infinite. I mean, they're two sides. Uh, they go to uh, symptotic infinity. The other guys, they have smaller path lengths. So when they go through the emitting fluid, they have at least half times infinity lesser lesser emitting density. So you're going to see a sharp drop at the photon uh, at the shadow boundary anyway. It's the same here. The path lengths is what is extremely important. Does that make sense? Okay, maybe 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 let me. Yeah, right. So, uh, right. So we have this delta parameter, which tells us how much does the uh, does can the shadow diameter of any black hole that you want to use as a model for Sagittarius A star differ from the Schwarzschild number, which is six root three m. So we we already have this measurement. It looks like this for one set of all one one this, this one element in table. Uh, and so now what we can do is that we can test a uh, space-time metric. We can ask, what if Sagittarius A star is not a curved black hole? So it's not a curved black hole, not a black hole, not GR. We can do all of these things. Uh, There's not a perfect not, but yes. So we can do all of these things. And here I just show you what, where EHP lies in, the, the experimental gravitational test of EHP, where, what part of the theory parameter space it occupies. So if you look at uh, physical phenomena and plot them, on this, on these axes, as the the strength of the gravitational potential, basically a measure of the mass, and the strength of the curvature. So this is, uh, I mean, uh, so smaller black holes will have larger curvatures, and larger black holes will have smaller curvatures. 
So this 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 curvature is also telling me that. So you look at solar system tests; they occupy this region here. You look at pulsar tests; they occupy this region here. Gravitational waves occupy this region here, and supermassive black holes occupy this region. Here. So you can see that these are really occupying a different part of the parameter space, and you are doing tests of general relativity in this particular region. And if you're able to establish consistency uh, or confidence in general relativity there, it's it's nice. Overall, you get a much nicer picture. Okay, so this, this is the plot that we've been working towards. If you look at different, here, here again, I'm plotting the shadow size, the, the fraction, fractional de diameter deviation delta, which is the difference in fractional di difference in the shadow size from the Schwarzschild value. So for Schwarzschild, all of these space times go to Schwarzschild when the general, generalized charge goes to zero. So you can see that the generalized charge, the deviation is zero. But once you start tuning the generalized charge, all these black holes get changed their shadow sizes. As we saw, they're all getting smaller, except for this curve, which I will ignore again. Uh, so you see that the constraint that we just got on this previous slide is this white band here, and you get constraints on if it's a string theory black hole, what is the maximum allowed charge it can have and be consistent with saturation system. So this is what you can do with non-spinning black holes. This is a scenario with spinning black holes, different types of spinning black holes. You can again set constraints. Uh, this is what we get with naked singularities and known holes. So, the, for example, you can see that this naked singularity is entirely ruled out. This is a reason not shown naked singularity, and this is uh, this is a wormhole. This is this is a generalized Morse common wormhole, and here, these are all way too small uh, to to actually be consistent with the image of Sagittarius system. So we can actually astrophysically say uh, that you know this is probably not a wormhole. So these are these are nice statements that we can start making now, uh, and um, you can see also that this is a uh, this is a naked singularity that is not entirely ruled out because it has a photon sphere and it can be large enough. Uh, it can be in the in the in the you know the sweet range, sweet spot, and be consistent with saturation. Uh, here are the parameter spaces of these two string theory black holes I was talking about. On the top is the is the is, is the non-spinning two copy U one gauge field uh, a two uh, two electromagnetic field theory uh, black holes, and you can see that you can basically rule out this shaded region of the parameter space. There's a Kersen black hole where you can see that you can also rule out, rule out this part of the parameter space. So these are really the first observational tests of string theory. Uh, so that's, that's great. You can also do these with these, um, these perturbed black hole metrics, these parameterized black hole metrics. I can obtain generic constraints on what the size of the, division, uh, size of the perturbation parameter is. So if you're zero in all of these, then you are uh, basically curved. If not, uh, if not, you are deviating away from. Uh, sorry, if you're zero in all of these, you're Schwarzschild, and these black lines show you uh, curve. And if not, so this this shows us that the curve paradigm has good. Uh, I mean, we have good confidence that it's uh, it's a consistent, um, you know, with, uh, consistent with the images of these black holes. So you can also do a post newtonian test. You can cast all of those previous things that we learned onto these axes, onto the one pn and two pn axis. And we get constraints on the post newtonian parameters as well. So the uh, yeah, so we can just look at so we get tight constraints of post newtonian parameters, which we also plot in these in these panels here. And these are what what this is also showing you is that they are basically the EHT ones are in these stars uh, here, and they are basically comparable with other uh, post newtonian tests uh, of uh, GM with other measurements. That's great. So I I, I just I. I'm sort of running out of time, so I'll just go through this in a few minutes. So we saw what we can do with the uh, with the shadow radius. We can set constraints, but like I also mentioned, we there are there are inherent uh, degeneracies. Uh, if you look at multi-parameter black hole models, you can get degeneracies where you have different black holes having exactly the same shadow size. So to break this degeneracy, we'd like to look at other observables, and the one that's come up in the last few months, uh, few years, is the is the Lyapunov experiment. Which I'll just quickly talk about. Uh, also, much of this work was done here at the VHI, so that's that's great. Um, okay, so let me just introduce the notion of higher order images really quickly. Again, spherically symmetric space times. So on the plot in the left, you have a you have a Schwarzschild black hole, and let's say you have emission coming from a point here, and the observer is at z equal to infinity. Uh, so you have one photon that starts from this location and ends up on the sky. But you have another photon emitted from the same emitter 
that loops that does another extra half loop around the black hole and ends up here. You have another, yet another photon which does a full loop and ends up on the observer sky here. So you can see that. Uh, so the so this guy is in the equatorial plane. The observer is at uh, theta equal to zero. So the difference, the ang total angular deflection for the red photon is pi over two, and you can see immediately that this emitter can be connected to this observer here for every photon which is deflecting by pi over two mod two pi. So you have you have multiple photons that are getting to the observer from the same emitter. Now. These different photons had different path lengths, so they will traverse through space-time, uh, taking longer, taking different times. So uh, they will take different times. They will deflect by larger angles. They will appear at different locations on the image plane, etc. But uh, if you look at look at a stationary uh, emitter, you have an accretion flow that's basically settled down. You will get all these photons uh, roughly at the same time uh, at, at the at the image plane, and you can try to see all of these different photons uh, and compare compare uh, properties uh, that relate them. So, uh, so th th this red, red photon uh, co constitutes the first or zeroth order image of this source and the blue photon will be the first order image and so on. So this is how we, this is what I mean by higher order images. You can also see from this plot on the right that if you have a photon, if you have if you have three locations, uh, the red, blue, and green uh, locations, radial locations in the in the bulk of space time, and you're emitting photons from these three different locations, they will appear on the sky on the image plane at three different uh, points. Of course, uh, they will have different uh, impact parameters, which is what I'm showing in this zoom out. And but if you look at so these are the these are zeroth order impact parameters. So these are the first first photons. The shortest path length photons that are making it to the observer, and they have this, they, they appear at different locations in the sky. But if you look at uh, the first order photons, these are they are still they are just on the other side of the black hole, and they have the same uh, radial. They're emitted from the same uh, radial distances as the guys on the right. But you see that the first order photons are actually appearing in a smaller band than the zeroth order photons. So. Higher order images get tend to get squished further and further uh, close to the critical curve, which is which is here at three root three for sure. So uh, if you if you look at the second order image, for example, they they will really be almost. I mean, you can't actually see them in this plot. So higher order images of the same source will get squished further and further towards the critical curve or the shadow curve. Great. So this this is another way to see the same thing. If you have a disk now, not a point emitter. If you have a disk, you will see the image, uh, the zeroth order image as like this, the first order image as like this, and the second order image like this and so on. Okay, and now let's actually go to the simulation itself that we were using earlier. This this is the, the whole thing that you see outside, it's just the zeroth order image of the, of the emitting region. This bright ring that you see here is all of the higher order images. The first order, th this guy, the first order image of the emitting region, the second order image and so on. They're all sort of, Overlapping and they're exactly at this location, and in the limit of n equal to infinity, you actually approach. You are exactly at the critical curve itself. So, if you're able to see this bright ring in your images with future uh, measurements, you have an exact test of. Uh, you have an exact measurement of the shadow self, which is great, and you can see the effect of inclination as well. You still always see this. Uh, you know, you always see this. Uh, Higher order images close, uh, uh, being attached very close to the critical curve. So this is all great. We can we can get a excellent measurement of the shadow size if we see higher order images. But uh, higher order images, I, I will skip this actually. Uh, higher order images, actually maybe not. Higher order images also have this very nice thing that uh, very nice property uh, that they 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 there's, there's, there's a very nice symmetry which I'll just get to in a second. So we have we saw this plot earlier, the deflection of photons. I'm just plotting it here directly with the impact parameter on the on the x-axis. Different photons will will get deflected by different amounts. But one thing that they have in common is that photons that are very close to the critical curve itself, the shadow boundary, they will have they will undergo extremely large deflection, as you can see here, for example. So uh, these this region here is a region of extremely strong gravitation, gravitational lensing. 
and you can see that there's actually a log this divergence is actually a logarithmic divergence and the uh, and the thing the the exponent that controls this logarithmic divergence is what we call the lyapunov exponent and if you measure two uh, successive images you can actually extract this lyapunov exponent and this this is this represents a different observable algorithm than the shadow cells so i'll just uh, in the time i have left i'll just tell you what the lyapunov exponent exactly is and leave it at that um okay so just to get to what the lyapunov exponent is I, let me just shift briefly to the face space spherically symmetric space times again so you can write down uh, so with a, with a vector r and pr uh, the radius and the uh, conjugate momentum of the radial variable as a as a vector uh, you can write down the geodesic flow equation like this where the hamiltonian is just the hamiltonian for geodesic motion which we saw earlier in the, as lagrange okay so we have this this potential v of r which appears here is just is just given uh, like this so it's essentially uh, this piece minus the radial kinetic energy if you want to think of it like that so so this is the this is the flow equation and critical points occur of course when uh, when the symplectic hamiltonian vector field goes to zero and we will see what that actually means so uh, so let me also say this this v of r actually also contains uh, the, uh, the the impact parameter so it's so it's a two parameter function which is r and uh, also the impact parameter so this whole thing depends on just r and the impact parameter essentially okay so let's now look at the linearized flow equation uh, this is going somewhere i promise uh, so if you construct the deviation vector on phase space as just like this as, as we do stand, uh, the standard way to do it you can write down the linearized flow uh, where you have the we have the constant uh, linearized hamiltonian given like this this is just the uh, symplectic uh, hessian of the hamiltonian function evaluated at the critical point and for this particular case for this particular hamiltonian you get you get you it looks like this okay so uh, but we must remember that so here i told you that all of this depends on only the impact parameter you have to also account for the fact that the hamiltonian is zero which is a constant of the motion so solving for hamiltonian equal to zero from this from this equation here just gives us a relation between pr and the potential as as this where r is the radial potential is just uh, this r dot over here so we have all, we have this taking into account the last constant of the motion we just put this back into all of these equations and we get we can rewrite the symplectic hamiltonian vector field the full guy like this and uh, the flow looks as such so you can see that this this looks very similar to the picture i showed you uh, quite some time back you have photons that are so you, you can see that this basically what i wanted to show you with this is that there's a critical point here which corresponds to uh, the impact parameter of the i mean which, which is the shadow boundary and also the photon flow so this is the critical point in phase space again, which is not surprising uh, okay so now we can also write down the linearized hamiltonian using the h equal to 0 constraint and we can just write it explicitly out like this so it's very nice and uh it's very nice you can see that i've introduced this constant kappa which is just the second derivative of the radial potential which is going to be a lyapunov exponent so uh so this linear equation i'm just writing it back here uh, so this is just xi xi dot equal to lh xi and you, you see that you have an od a couple uh, couple set of bodies and you have a solution like this let me just quickly go through this this r bar is the deviation uh deviation of an orbit uh from so uh, if you start from an orbit that is slightly radially perturbed from the proton sphere what is the evolution of that what is the radial evolution of that orbit this is what that shows you so in a tr diagram uh this is basically showing you how rapidly uh, a photon that is slightly displaced from the photon sphere either escapes to infinity or falls into the vacuum so th this and you see that this this rate of divergence uh, is basically the lyapunov exponent so this is a guy that we can get also from images uh, but i will not go into that at all what i just want i'll just skip to the results and say that you can plot the lyapunov exponent which again this lyapunov exponent depends only on the space time as uh, only depends on null null geodesics and uh, properties of null geodesics and therefore um, on the space time uh, metric functions itself so you have a different variable 
And what I'm showing you is the same parameter spaces that I showed you earlier with these two dimensional black holes where we had, you know, uh, a set of black hole that are exactly the same shadow size shown in these dashed lines in all of these plots. And now you have another set of curves that are layer pillow experiments for each black hole, uh, you know, with these parameters. And here they are actually intersecting at single points. So you can use the Lyapunov exponent to actually break these indices if you measure both the Lyapunov exponent and the uh, and the shadow size uh, from black hole images. So this is where we're going towards, and this is this is very exciting. We can get much stronger constraints on the on general relativity uh, by using both of these guys. And okay, this is what I skipped wanted to skip over, but yeah. So I'll just I'll just end by saying that so far we've been able to extract the size of the shadow uh, for actual astrophysical objects like M87 star or Sagittarius star, and we're able to we showed how we're able to use this uh, these images to extract the shadow size and then to test uh, different theoretical models. That's great. Now in the future we want to look at strong lensing features with the next generation of black hole imaging with the Next generation event horizon telescope, for example, and try to extract the lensing Lyapunov experiment. We are a bit far away from establishing that this is possible, not very far away, but uh, from the pragmatic viewpoint, if we do get the Lyapunov experiment as well, then we will be able to, like I showed you, set strong constraints on deviations from uh, general relativity. And yeah, I'd like to end there. Thanks. Thanks for that. practical for a wonderful talk. Any question or comments? So I'm expecting the version that small deviations can dramatically change the Yeah, right. Yeah, so it's a question. Yes, exactly. So in this parameterized uh, in this parameterized setting, this is again uh, spherically symmetric black holes. But you can see that, for example, this curve is the one that has uh, the Schwarzschild uh, value of the Lyapunov spin. You move slightly further away, like we didn't say, like if you have some accuracy of measuring the Lyapunov spin, it could be somewhere at infinity within those band, within that band. And that means that the deviation parameters, space time deviation parameters, can be drastically different from these agnostic test settings. I just so want to make a, a short comment. Yeah. First of all, very nice talk. I just want to point out that there are some very primitive uh, numerical calculations of these orbits of photons. There is Schwarzschild in the MTW in Mr. Thorne. Mm -hmm. In Wheeler, we did it with a WAG computer. I did it with uh, with Johnny Wheeler. So you might look at the MTW of these. Again, of course, he's a way more sophisticated, but I just want to point out something that was done a long, long time ago. Right, right, yeah. Over absolutely. 50 years ago. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, yeah, I, I uh, yeah, in some of these slides, I should have put in more references. This is not something that is new. Uh, like already, for example, the fact that you could get the Lyapunov exponent from uh, the intensity of successive higher order images something that was known in 1986 by you know there's papers by Mohanian who's written exactly these sorts of things. So I, I fully take your point. And yeah, I, I, I should add more references. Yeah, thank you. Very nice talk. Thank you. If no questions, that's the sense. Thank you. So Thanks for the great talk. Thanks. I have to run to a class and uh, chat sometime. Yeah, that'd be great. I've seen your papers, of course. <laughs>